Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, we're looking at Nigeria, the unrest, the bombings, and the story of Boko Haram, and Sahara Reporters, an online alternative for news in Nigeria. Iran's Press TV off the air in the UK, while a Kurdish channel gets the boot from a French satellite. And Activated. our web video of the week, the Distractotron. Distractotron confronts growing economic inequality. Television that keeps us from seeing the big picture. Rick Santorum eating chicken wings. It's only been a couple of years since the name of the Nigerian group Boko Haram first seeped into the global news consciousness. Boko Haram translates as Western education is sacrilege. That's a much snappier title than the official one, which is people committed to the propagation of the Prophet's teachings and jihad. Boko Haram is growing in notoriety. It has been blamed for almost 1,000 deaths since 2009, 200 in the last month alone. However, little is known about this movement. It is secretive, and its various spokespersons cannot always be traced back to the group itself. For journalists, both local and foreign, it does not help that the group's followers often see the media as embodiments of the same secular Western values that they are opposed to. That's hardly the basis for a good working relationship and open flow of information. Our starting point this week is the site of the latest bombing. It's the city of Kano in northern Nigeria. A 24-hour curfew in the northern city of Kano after a string of deadly attacks. The momentum that has gathered in Boko Haram with some major attacks has put Boko Haram firmly on the international agenda. Attack revendiqué par la sect islamiste Boko Haram. Boko Haram thrives on the publicity. It thrives on the mayhem it creates by people hearing about them and hearing about the terror that they've unleashed. Just who are Boko Haram? What do we know about this group? What is it they're seeking? It is hard to know what to make of Boko Haram, a movement that is known by a name that the movement itself did not even come up with. The label, Boko Haram, they don't call themselves that. Boko Haram is a label that has been applied to them by the government and by parts of the media. Now, they don't seem to actively reject it either, but the fact that the label comes not from the movement itself, but from the outside, says something about the lack of a, a Boko Haram media strategy, and it also says something about the challenges that we all have to understand it. Another challenge has been really understanding the group's ideology. What exactly do Boko Haram want? At the beginning of their insurgency, it was very clear that they wanted a strict form of Islamic law across Nigeria. They wanted Sharia law across Nigeria. Uh, in some states, they wanted Christians to move out of those states. But if you look at the last few months, their strategy has changed incredibly, and so have their targets. They now target those important important symbols of Nigerian authority, government buildings, uh, police stations, military barracks. And every time they've, they've attacked, they've given out you know, a different reason for attacking. How do they get access to journalists? They have phone numbers of journalists, they call up journalists, they instruct them on what to write about them, and they control their own media. And if they do not call the journalists, there is no way of getting to them. So it's like a one-way, it's a one-way street. Boko Haram was founded 10 years ago, but the violent side of the movement has been ramping up since 2009. Nigerian security forces moved against the group, they said, because Boko Haram was arming itself. The resulting bloodshed led to 700 deaths. Video emerged of cold-blooded executions by government forces. And it is supremely ironic that a movement that opposes most of what modernity has to offer owes much of its growing prominence to one piece of mobile phone video from 2009 that implicated government forces and made a martyr of Boko Haram's leader. Mohammed Youssef, who was important during the early days of Boko Haram, he in effect was extrajudicially murdered uh, by the Nigerian police. And that murder all but occurred on television. The death of Mohammed Yusuf 
and the way that that came into the public domain is a good indication of how the revolution in communications has changed the way that Nigeria uh, looks at itself, has changed the way that the, the media in Nigeria operates. In this case, there was this tremendously powerful set of images of a man essentially being executed on the streets in cold blood. It has sent huge shockwaves uh, through the uh, media in Nigeria and the security forces because what happened with that video became part and parcel of the currency of how Boko Haram emerged as the force that it presently is today. The fact that he was extrajudicially murdered has played an element in building popular acquiescence, if not support, for what uh, Boko Haram does in some parts of the country. In the two years since, messages have been sent to the media in the name of the organization. However, journalists have been unable to determine if the sources of those messages were legitimate. Boko Haram has been a faceless, virtually leaderless movement. That changed on January 11th. The deployment of a video on YouTube in January was an indication that, uh, that the leader of the organization, Abubakar, Shikau wanted to show Nigerians, to show the world that he was in control of a single organization, that he was, in a sense, using the tools of uh, Al-Qaeda in terms of the image that he was displaying in that video with the uh, bulletproof vest and the Kalashnikov rifles. But the message that he was giving out was very much one designed to be heard and uh, listened to in Nigeria. There are also a couple of websites with Boko Haram messages, but it's been impossible for journalists to follow these individuals up with serious, rigorous, one-to-one -one investigative interviews or journalism. And in some cases, reporting on Boko Haram has proven to be deadly. Two Nigerian journalists have been killed by the organization, one a Muslim, the other a Christian. For at least some elements of Boko Haram, the media, and here, particularly the technical media, uh, people who operate cameras, for example, are seen as representative of the secular, essentially materialist society and state to which they are so bitterly opposed. Boko Haram has targeted some journalists. Last year, Alaji Zakaria was targeted and killed because According to a Boko Haram um, spokesperson, he was an SSS, so um, state um, security service um, informant. And um, how true that is that he was working for the SSS, I mean, nobody knows. But the important thing was that he was, you know, he was a journalist and he was targeted and he was killed. They were saying, if you like, this is a warning that they said that they had no problem with uh, journalism as such, but they weren't going to allow that relationship to be used as a mechanism for undermining the organization. Initially, Boko Haram broke most of the rules of the media game in terms of branding, visibility, and accessibility. It is difficult to know for certain why that has changed. But having witnessed how instantly modern media can change perceptions, Boko Haram has, if not embraced, at least engaged with some of that technology. In their eyes, those phone cameras may well be haram, but they are powerful, irresistible weapons in the battle for hearts and minds in Nigeria. Our Global Village Voice is now on the coverage of the Boko Haram story in Nigeria. Nigerian media is unfortunately buying into the Western narrative of a Christian South and a Muslim North. Of course, Nigeria isn't quite so clear cut. You have a sizable Christian population among the ethnic groups in the North, lapsing into the easy dichotomy of lazy journalism. The media strategy of Boko Haram is simple. They work on the response. There is a bomb blast or an attempted bomb blast. It creates panic. Each news medium wants to be the first to break the news. So what does the Boko Haram do? They wait a while and then gradually choose any of the news medias, be they online or traditional media, and claims responsibility for the attack. And that's simply their media strategy. 
We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our Global Village Voices, you can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter where we will let you know what stories we're working on. Or you can get in touch with us via email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. And don't forget, there's our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. A little less than 10 months after he was arrested, a blogger who came to be known as Egypt's first prisoner of conscience of the post-Mubarak era has been freed. Michael Nabil was arrested last March after he posted an article on his blog that was extremely critical of the Egyptian military and its conduct during last year's uprisings that eventually drove President Mubarak from power. Nabil was sentenced to three years in prison by a military court. That sparked a series of protests demanding Nabil's release. In August, Michael Nabil's family said he had gone on a hunger strike that Nabil would rather die than accept the military court's ruling. To mark the first anniversary of the Egyptian uprising, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces has pardoned the blogger and it says a further 1,959 prisoners will be released. The latest twist in the media war between London and Tehran has forced Iran's English language news channel, Press TV, off the air in the UK. Press TV fell afoul of the UK's TV regulator, Ofcom, again, this time for breaching the UK's Communications Act and has had its broadcasting license revoked. Last year, Press TV was fined £100,000 by Ofcom after it aired the forced confession of Newsweek journalist Maziar Bahari back in 2009. That interview was recorded in a Tehran prison cell. Press TV failed to pay that fine on time. However, the official reason given for the channel's license being revoked, according to Ofcom, is that Press TV's editorial control lies in Tehran rather than in the UK, and that is a breach of the channel's license. Press TV is insisting that this decision has more to do with politics and its coverage of the British government and the royal family than anything else. The Paris-based satellite operator UTELSAT has angered free speech advocates by dropping the signal of a Kurdish TV station. Raj TV is based in Denmark and has been found guilty by a court there of supporting the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK, a separatist group that has been fighting the Turkish government for an independent Kurdish state ever since 1984. The PKK is deemed to be a terrorist organization by Turkey, the U.S. and the EU, amongst others. The Danish court fined the two companies that run the channel $11,000 each for airing one-sidedly and uncritically disseminated PKK messages, including incitement to revolt and to join the organization. However, the court did not rule that the channel should be taken off the air. That decision came from UTELSAT itself, which reportedly took the decision to suspend the broadcasts to avoid any criminal liability that it could face for distributing the channel's signal. The Paris-based media watchdog group, Reporters with Without Borders says it is shocked by what it calls a unilateral decision and it says the decision violates freedom of expression. For the first time since it started publishing 71 years ago, the Chicago Sun-Times newspaper will not be endorsing a candidate in the upcoming U.S. presidential elections. The editorial board of the paper made that announcement on its website saying we have come to doubt the value of candidate endorsements by this newspaper or any newspaper, especially in a day when a multitude of information sources allow even a casual voter to be better informed than ever before. The paper also said that candidate endorsements promote the perception of a hidden bias by a newspaper. The other way to look at this would be, if a newspaper has a hidden bias, it would be much easier to keep that bias hidden by not openly endorsing its favored candidate. We're only a month into 2012 and stories out of Nigeria have been all over the news. There's been coverage of Occupy Nigeria, protests against rising fuel prices and bomb attacks by the aforementioned Boko Haram. While the country's media have been trying to cover these stories, it's not been easy. Nigeria's news media do not have the best reputation. Many outlets seem to be more loyal to the government or their corporate paymasters than they are to sound journalistic principles. One website that's managing to report and make news is called Sahara Reporters. It made its debut online back in 2006 and it's become a media phenomenon in Nigeria largely because 
It's not based there. The site's editor, Omoyele Soware, works out of New York City, well beyond the reach of Nigeria's rich and powerful. And his reporters are everyday Nigerians who photograph, video, and blog for the website. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the site that's shaking up the Nigerian news landscape. From his office in Manhattan, New York, Omoyele Shawore, the editor of Sahara Reporters, is whipping up a media froth 8,000 kilometers away in Abuja, Nigeria. Well, Sahara Reporters is a very popular media outlet here in Nigeria, and I guess what appeals to people is the nature of the stories they report. Eyewitness accounts, just raw information about sensitive issues that uh, the press in Nigeria is too afraid to publish or report. Stories like those investigating the financial sponsors of Boko Haram, one of Nigeria's deadliest militant groups, or articles dealing with touchy tribal politics in Nigeria's various states. But the story that put Sahara reporters on the news map in Nigeria had to do with the president. Thousands of protesters took to the streets of the federal capital territory Abuja to condemn the absence of Mr. President. Late in 2009, the president was sick and out of the country. The government kept the details under wraps and reporting by Nigerian media was thin on facts. Most senators uh, expressed their anger over the lack of credible information on the health status of the number one citizen. Sahara reporters got the story, reporting where the president was, what the health issue was, and kept a running count of his days out of the country. It's the kind of journalism Nigerian media do not typically provide. Most of what Nigerians get their news from, I mean the newspapers, the TV stations, have been completely taken over by the money bags. So, that has diluted the media as we know it. It's a media market that is dominated by politicians and influential businessmen, and it limits investigative reporting, and uh, it leads to sometimes unethical uh, journalism or unethical practices. But this is not unique to Nigeria. It happens all across Africa. Can we get an email? An email, or you can send me a text. Which know? is why Shawari's decision to base himself out of New York is a smart one. In 2010 alone, Reporters Without Borders recorded 40 incidents of press violations in Nigeria. Three journalists were killed. Seven were kidnapped in South Nigeria. Others faced death threats. An office in Manhattan puts Shawari at a safe distance. Sahara Reporters Run From New York allows uh, this website to be free and independent of persecution and harassment. In the past, we have documented cases where Nigerian security have arrested individuals that were suspected of being affiliated with his websites. This is a website that is a target, a prime target for the Nigerian government. Because Sahara Reporters has been based on the web and overseas, they, there hasn't been that fear of reporting uh, what they believe to be true. And I think that that's what Nigerians have really re uh, respected um, and uh, embraced about Sahara Reporters. And that, what, that's why it continues to grow in popularity. Sahara Reporters, I, mostly I browse it on the net. And I find it very interesting. They give quality information. Sahara reporters have really gone a long way to expose some of the hues of society that have been kept under the carpet by the Nigerian and mainstream media. The website's popularity isn't just with Nigerian readers. A lot of the traffic to the site comes from people wanting to contribute. Shawore employs no formal staff. His website's tagline is, report yourself, and he means it. There are people who are saying to themselves, you know, we used to consume news, but we can actually produce news ourselves. We are doing the part of media or news reporting that is too important to be left to journalists or professionals. It really has changed the face of online journalism with respect to the Nigerian audience. Nigerians love information. They are news junkies, at least most of them are. And Sahara Reporters has given them a forum where they can express themselves. 
But while crowdsourced reporting can be powerful and, as Tunisia and Egypt proved, revolutionary, it also has drawbacks. One of the major challenges that citizen journalism faces is accuracy of information. Uh, because when you're getting uh, thousands of uh, reports, eyewitness accounts, it is difficult to sometimes uh, determine whether or not these reports are accurate or not. Well, Sahara Reporters has been controversial in some respects, and Al Jazeera have been the target of Sahara Reporters' journalism. The president was plagued by serious bouts of illness. Last year, when the former president died, it was reported that uh, the first lady of Nigeria had approached Al Jazeera about getting her brother-in-law onto uh, one of our reports. And I read in their reports, my name was mentioned several times about approaches towards me uh, by members of the family. Now, that never happened. The Sahara reporters packaged the whole thing as if the, the first family had essentially paid for airtime, which was completely unfounded and untrue. Sahara reporters may get caught out once or twice, but that isn't denting the website's following. Sahara reporters and Mr. Sawori are part of a larger community of uh, citizen uh, journalists and online-based bloggers and reporters who are more and more uh, gaining prominence by uh, breaking uh, some of the biggest stories in Africa. It is a wonderful uh, phenomenon which has allowed so many other voices to join the debate. But the truth is that with social media, everybody actually controls their own media space now. You have a Twitter account, you transmit your own news on it. You have Facebook, you have friends. What is important is for people to get the message as small as possible in a big way. And that's why we're hit, you know, with Nigerians. Africa's most populous nation seems precariously balanced on a knife edge. It's growing more expensive, looks more dangerous, and the approval ratings of the government are tanking. That's the kind of news that has Nigerians logging on to Sahara reporters. There are thousands of stories to be told, millions of voices to be heard, on the site that delivers news on Nigeria via New York. More Global Village Voices now on alternative news sources on Nigeria. Sahara reporters are a credible organization that's come to the forefront of media in Nigeria and across Africa over the last many years. The reasons for this stem from the fact that there has been a lack of balance in the Nigerian media scene. I'm an adjunct reader of Sahara reporters, but I must point out that when media in general is unfortunately not yet an integral part of Nigeria, society. There is plenty of room for innovation as our society embraces the internet further. However, abject poverty and a rather high illiteracy index have been major setbacks to our interaction with the internet in general. A lot of Nigerians are, you know, tripping online to get uh, first-hand information of what's going on in their country. So Sarah reporters, Nigerian Village Squares, and lots and lots of bloggers around the world are contributing immensely to information dissemination in Nigeria. And I think the future of Nigeria will depend a lot on uh, how people use and consume information from the net. Finally, the coverage of politics tends to favor personalities over policies. Scuttlebutt over substance, and the coverage of the current Republican race for the White House has not exactly broken that mold. Our web video of the week is called Distractotron. It's yet another gem from Mark Fiore. He's one of the sharpest, most prolific satirists working on the World Wide Web, and he spotted the perfect opportunity to poke a little fun at all of the tittle-tattle, as well as at the box that distracts us from the real story. We'll see you next time at the listening post. 500 feet below an Iowa corn silo is the most advanced weapon of mass distraction ever created. Distractotron. Primary contest update activated. Now deployed to the surface. Distractotron confronts growing economic inequality. Rick Santorum eating chicken wings. Rick Santorum eating chicken wings. Distractotron addresses impending economic doom in Europe. Gingrich weeping. Gingrich weeping. Mother-son emotion alert. Distractotron tackles unrest and thousands killed in Syria. 
candidate at Homestyle Diner. Homestyle Diner. Flannel visible. Flannel visible. And what of the quest for freedom in Egypt? Free cookies at the caucus. Free cookies at the caucus. Distractotron confronts the defense bill's indefinite detention of citizens. Santorum sweater vest alert. Sweater vest alert. No matter the importance, no matter the crisis, Distractotron fights for spoof, just fluff, and the American demise. Romney eating spaghetti, Ron Paul supporters shaving, Distractotron, love Bachman, love Bachman, don't go.